Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us for day two of our GitOps days. Um, for everyone who tuned in yesterday, we really appreciate it. We love the interaction that we had with everyone on our Slack channel. Continue to post all of your, your uh, comments and questions in our Slack channel. Um, kicking off our uh, uh, opening keynote on day two is our very own CTO, uh, Cornelia Davis. Cornelia, how are you? Uh, let's hit all the unmute buttons. I'm doing quite well. How about you, Damani? I'm doing really well, doing really well. Uh, a lot of conversations about your business value com uh, uh, commentary and the way that you do such an amazing job of breaking these things down and put them into bite-sized pieces. So um, we're very much interested to, to see you uh, dig a little bit deeper uh, this morning in this opening keynote. Yep, great. And we are going to dig deep. So, but for those of you who maybe are still new, don't worry, there'll be plenty for you to come along with. So, um, thank you, Damani. I will go ahead and get started. Um, let me share my screen. And we will move on. Let me start my presentation. So, we are going to talk about GitOps, obviously, um, for the next hour, and we are going to go into a fair level of detail. I'm not going to go into any specific project demos or really talk about, I will talk a little bit about a project here and there, but I'm really going to stay at the coarse grain, but we will go deep. So trust me, both those, those things are not mutually exclusive. Now, before we dive into those details, though, I thought I would take just a moment to introduce myself. I am relatively new to WeaveWorks. I've been here since the beginning of the year. Um, my, as a back, just so you know a little bit about my background, I am a computer scientist by training um, and have been practicing that for about the last 30 years. Came more from the development side and you see there in parentheses, it says I wasn't ops. Now the interesting thing is that I spent my prior roughly seven years or so at Pivotal, um, I came there from EMC, where I worked in the corporate CTO office doing architecture and emerging tech, and largely continued to do that role at Pivotal. But I worked on a platform there, and I worked on a cloud native application platform. It was one of the earlier ones. And so that's really what's given me my grounding in the last eight or years or so around cloud native and cloud native application platforms. So yesterday we heard a lot of people talking about enabling developers and enabling um, repeatability and those types of things. So I have a, a fair bit of experience with that. Um, and it's, in fact, the, 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 the desire to take that to the next level, the desire to make those platforms um, themselves repeatable or themselves configurable is really what drew me over to WeaveWorks. And I see GitOps as a critical technology to be able to achieve that. Um, it might seem a bit self-serving, but I do also want to mention that almost a year ago or almost exactly a year ago, uh, I went to press with my first book, Cloud Native Patterns, um, and uh, it, it's also very much related to this notion of cloud native. And what you might find interesting about that is that that book is targeted at the application developer and architect, and it's really around the design patterns for software, so cloud na native software. And what I'm talking about there is things like um, components, microservices, then when you start to deploy those microservices, how do they find each other? So we talk about patterns. I talk about patterns like service discovery. What happens when you're in a distributed system now and how you have to use things like circuit breakers to keep systems from melting down from DDoS, you know, inadvertent or intentional DDoS attacks, et cetera, et cetera. But it was really focused on those software design patterns. Um, and that, we've been talking a lot about cloud native operations. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've been talking a lot about cloud native operations the last day, um, and we'll continue to do so today. Well, that whole notion of cloud native software and those design patterns for highly distributed software that's experiencing constant change um, is a bit ahead of the, the, the curve in terms of operations. And so now what we're seeing, and again, that's the reason I've come to WeaveWorks, is we're seeing this opportunity to bring innovation into cloud native operations. 
that really began to a great extent with Kubernetes, but there's still a whole host of things that we can do to augment that, to build that out. And that's where the patterns, practices, even organizational structures, and certainly tools will help. So um, I'll also mention that one of the other, um, if you've come to the live stream without registering, I would encourage you to go uh, to the getopsdays.com and register on there as well, because we will be giving away a few um, eBooks um, of this book to, uh, we're, we'll be raffling that off based on who's been registered for the, uh, the conference. So without further ado, let's then jump into this overview and deep dive. Now, as I mentioned, I don't want to do an overview or a deep dive of specific technologies because I think we've already seen, and for those of you who are join us, joining us today for the first time, I'll kind of reiterate that GitOps is not an open source project or even two open source projects. It's really a paradigm. And there's a certain set of principles that we apply that we find kind of form a complete picture. And yesterday in, um, in the keynote yesterday morning, I kind of went through that derivation and talked a little bit more about the individual components and how combining all four of these things together in a very clever way gives us the proverbial, um, it's greater than the sum of the parts. So it's, it's not four, it's greater than four when we do these things. Now you'll notice as we go across these principles, which I'll take just a moment to go through, um, that there's a number of words that are bolded and highlighted in, in red there. So if we go start at the, both ends, at the bookends, we have on the left-hand side, the entire system is described declaratively. So this is now, APIs are not imperative. They're not do this step, then do this step, then do this step. APIs are declaring the state that you want. So we're, if you will, the APIs are programming data. And I uh, personally am a, a, a huge functional programmer, um, a big fan of functional programming, studied it when I was in graduate school, and in particular did Scheme. And one of the interesting things about functional languages is that they are, the, the programs themselves are data. And so there's this notion of APIs as data rather than APIs as instructions. So when we do that then, and we describe the entire system declaratively, then moving to the other bookend on the far right hand side, that allows us to have software agents that are then working to realize that declared desired state on the far left hand side. And this is a more recent innovation that really became ubiquitous through the embrace of Kubernetes. Before that, we still were mostly programming steps. Now that takes me to, I'll actually go to the automated changes or approved changes can be automatically applied. Automation. Automation is something that we've been doing obviously on the operational side for quite some time. But with this addition of declarative configuration and these reconcilers, these software agents, it allows us to change the nature of our automation. So we absolutely need automation and we are gonna talk a lot more about that in this next hour. We need that automation, but surfacing that automation, realizing that automation in new form factor, in particular, these software agents, and you'll see where the, the, those are used in a number of different places in the story, that is very critical as well. And then last but not least, funny because the name is GitOps, why wouldn't I start with Git? Is that Git, of course, forms an important part of that in that that's the place that we store those declarative configurations. And there's a few elements that are incredibly important about the way that we store that. So you can see there that again, I've kind of bolded declarative, software agents, automation, and Git are kind of key, key um, concepts. Now, I'm going to go through those concepts again for the next you know, 40 minutes or so, but I'm going to emphasize and highlight different words. So you can see here that starting with those words that I've now highlighted in blue, which is that the entire system 
So we'll talk a little bit about what that means and we'll go into the nuances. I hinted at this a little bit yesterday in the keynote, but we're gonna go into more detail. So the entire system is declared and it's versioned in Git. So it actually turns out that the versioning part of this is more important than Git. It just so happens that Git has what we need. So in the first part of what I wanna talk about in this hour is I wanna drill in on what we mean by version and versioning history. And in fact, I use a term, I like to use a term that it's not Git specifically that's important. It's a set of semantics that Git brings to the equation. So we'll talk about those semantics right now. So we know that Git stores a version history and that version history is really important. Each one of the nodes in that version history stores an entire um, representation of the state of that version. So if, for those of you who have had experience with other um, uh, source code control systems like SVN and some of the earlier ones, they really optimized for a different use case. They did things like every single step, they did have a version history, but not every node in the version history had the entire representation of the state. It had diffs. They often implemented diffs. What's interesting about this is that implementing, a, uh, capturing a diff is like capturing an instruction. Going back to the metaphor of functional programming versus imperative programming, imperative programming being what most of us are used to. Those are the Javas and the Cs and the C++s pluses and, and yes, even Fortran. Um, Kelsey's talked about Fortran in the past. Are do this step, do this step, do this step. The old source code control systems really followed that kind of imperative pattern. Sure, when we added a new file that was stored in that version history, but then when we changed a file, we only captured the actions, not the, in fact, the total outcome. So with Git, each one of those nodes has a full representation of the state. Now, yesterday in the talk on business outcomes, I talked a little bit about safety nets and how doing a rollback, being able to roll back if something starts to go wrong, or even if not during a deployment later on, something goes belly up with my most recent deployment, I can quickly roll back to the previous version. I don't need to replay a series of steps. I have a complete representation of that. That is an important part of the way that Git implements these things is that I can quickly get to the entire system state from any one of those nodes. Now, the next element about entire system state is something that I brought up yesterday as well, which is that we have some of that state stored in other systems. So certainly part of when we're deploying containerized applications, it's not just the application configuration, it's the actual container images that are needed. Or we heard about um, people using GitOps for CDNs. So you might have a whole set of images and those types of things that are getting distributed out to a content delivery network. So there might be a store that you're using. You're not necessarily going to store all your images in Git. You might store those in some kind of optimized store or something like an ISO. So for example, if you're wanting to get ops, the configuration of your virtual machines or even your physical machines, maybe you have a store of ISOs that have the blessed um, approved uh, operating system kernels that are available in your organization. Now, where do we store those things? Well, we might store those things in places like Docker Hub or an enterprise image registry like Harbor or Artifactory. Heck, you might even store some of these things like ISOs or images in an S3 bucket or any other type of store. So then here's the question I emphasized a moment ago on the far left-hand side, that the version history was incredibly critical, that that was something that was really leveraged. That was one of the Git semantics that were really important. But if we look at those repositories on the right-hand side, does Docker Hub have a version history? 
in time ordered version history? Is it immutable? Nope. Harbor, does it have some of those things? Well, it starts to because it's an enterprise registry, so enterprise repository. So it's starting to implement some of those things, but does it have all of the Git semantics? Mm, not sure. Um, Amazon S3 certainly doesn't. It's just, it's a bucket and you can bash things, you can, you can overwrite things, you can do all sorts of interesting things with this. So if, if versioning and some of these other semantics that I'm talking about are so critically important, does this mean that I have to store really everything in Git and that Git is the only source? Well, the answer is no, but there's good news. If you implement some of those semantics yourself, and that is possible to do, and I'll talk about ways that we do that, then you can leverage these other stores. Now, is there still value in using Git? Yes, and as we talk through some of the bullets on this, I'll, I'll draw out those, uh, those specifics. So on the left-hand side of this slide, you see just a screenshot of a Git log. In fact, I grabbed this screenshot yesterday, so you're seeing some of the most recent commits to Flux. Um, so you see Hide, who's one of my um, wonderful engineering colleagues here at Weaveworks, and a number of other folks, um, uh, I'm looking away from the, the uh, microphone here, uh, who are also part of the Flux community that have committed things. And what you can see there is that there's a number of things that are really interesting. The first thing that you'll notice is at the top of each commit is a unique identifier for that commit. It's a tag, if you will. Now, one of the things that's really clever about Git is that those tags are SHAs. So there is no way that you can change the content of a file or change the content of commit without changing the SHA because the SHA always reflects the data that's in that version of your Git repository. And that's really critical. And, and what that represents is that Git has this tagging and this immutability deeply, deeply baked into the Git implementation. That's what I mean by the Git semantics being baked into that implementation. Now, does Docker have something like that? I mean, Docker Hub have something like that? Well, yes, you can do that. Um, you can certainly get the SHA of your Docker images. And perhaps that's exactly what you want to do, is that you want to tag the things that are in your Docker, your image registry, with the SHA for the container image itself or you might use the SHA of the container image that was created from some Git SHA. The point is that you are now responsible for that semantic that's deeply embedded in Git. You're responsible for creating that yourself. Well, the good news is we talked yesterday about the maturity of the CI process. That's been a process that's been maturing for the last 10, 20 years already. Implement that as a part of your Git pipe, your, your CI pipelines, so that when you're generating those container images and delivering them to the repository, that you are creating unique tags. Now, one of the side notes there is don't ever use uh, colon latest um, when you're tagging those things. Now, the other thing that you're going to need to do then is you're going to need to make sure that your store is immutable. So make it right once. So how are those database keys, not to be confused with, with certificates and those types of keys, but how are those keys that are tagging each one of the, the things in your um, registry getting created? How are those generated? Are you sure that those aren't overwritable? Um, the other thing is you wanna set up some ACLs on your repository so that nobody can go and delete things. So that's the only way that you're going to be able to recreate an environment is if the images are there as well. Now, what about time ordering? So something like S3 doesn't have any time ordering. The interesting thing here is, this is where I was alluding to, the combination of Git and an external store is if Git is used in combination with that, then we can depend on the Git time ordering 
And we just have in our declarative configuration references to things that are in the repositories, the external repositories. So this doesn't mean that necessarily the external repository has to have that time ordering, but the way that you arrange how those external resources are leveraged in your entire GitOps workflow, you might be able to use Git to do that. We talked a little bit about storing complete entities or diffs in the previous thing. And then of course, there's this question of, are you accurately recording who the users are? Now, when I say user over in Git, we might think of it as human users, but increasingly we have all sorts of automation that's doing things in Git for us as well. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. So as you can see, really to sum up this, this part of it is the punchline is, Yes, you can use other stores, use the stores that are appropriate for the artifacts that you're capturing and things, uh, other examples might be things like credentials, using those in combination with Git and ensuring that across those things, you have the semantics in place that are gonna support some of the goals, some of the things that we realize with GitOps like repeatability. Um, so that's the thing to stay focused on. All right. So that was Git as a store, but Git actually also plays another important part of the GitOps lifecycle. And that is, we've been talking a lot about how the developers used to Git and why can't they just use Git to implement some of their operational workflows as well? And so there I'll say, maybe. What I did here was I grabbed, um, I grabbed a, uh, an issue from Kubernetes just last night. So I think you can see that this was, you know, last night it, the screenshot was about 20 hours before. So this is a recent merge into the Kubernetes code base. And there's a number of elements that are really pretty cool about this. So you see that there was an initial issue created. You can see who created it. You can see in this workflow that there are some slashes in the original description of this issue. So there's slash get scalability, there's slash assign to a particular user. And then a little bit further down, you can see in the history that there were a number of bots that did things on behalf of the user. So it assigned some labels. Now those labels are tied to various workflows that cause additional things to happen. And there's a fairly lengthy, the whole, the whole uh, thread isn't in here, but then at the end, you can see that in fact, um, in the end, we did merge uh, the commits that were, were produced um, for this particular issue. Those were merged into the code base. Now, from a developer perspective, they may be absolutely delighted because they're used to this workflow. But I think that hopefully as developers, we all can still have a little bit of empathy and try to remember how Git was for us in the beginning. And quite frankly, I still get befuddled by some of the stuff that happens in Git. Now take something like this and bring it to somebody who's not familiar with Git and oh, they might have a completely different viewpoint. So there's really two punchlines here as I close out this section where we're focusing on Git. We're gonna move on to other elements in just a moment. But there's really a couple of things that I wanna um, draw your attention to here from the user experience perspective. Is that yes, the actual something like GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket, the user interfaces that you have for that um, can be very valuable. And, particularly if you have individuals who are used to that and enjoy those workflows. Operators though, or some other parties may want a different user interface and that's perfectly fine. But what we want to do then is we wanna tie those user interfaces to Git at the back end so that when somebody uses, let's say a, a graphical user interface to scale a workload, that what we do in fact is we go and the effect of that isn't to scale the workload directly in the runtime system, but it is to deliver a commit into Git of scaling the number of instances from five to 10. Then we've got recorded and we have recorded the actual, the desired state that we want. And then we can use the GitOps process to deliver that desired state to the runtime 
and then the runtime can make it so. So the punchline there is think about Git as two things. It's, if you will, the data store at the far left-hand side of the GitOps picture, and it's a user interface, but it's valuable to separate those two notions and really clarify in your mind the two different things that are going on there. All right, so that was kind of on the left-hand side of the principles. The next thing that I wanna do is I want to emphasize a little bit more about the system. Now, we heard automation all day yesterday, and we will continue to hear it. And automation, of course, is one of the big things that we get from, from GitOps. Um, but here it says the approved changes can be automatically applied to the system. What I want to drill into a little bit is what the system is and what various topologies look like. Now, I counted at least three times that this diagram showed up in three different people's presentations. I showed it yesterday. There were at least two other presentations where speakers had this diagram or a version of this diagram. So it really is a very compelling diagram that says, hey, we've got the continuous integration process on the left, and then we've got this continuous operations process, delivery and operations process on the right-hand side. And let's not merge those. Sure, Git plays a role in that it is, if you will, the crossover point between those, and that's what we've just spent a fair bit of time talking about. But let's loosely couple those things. And the loose coupling of deployment from integration and operations is really interesting. Now, I want to expand this diagram a little bit into three pieces, because this is going to help us start to tease apart what the system looks like. So on the right-hand side is still that GitOps process, but there's really a couple of steps in that GitOps process. There's steps around delivery, and then there's steps about around the runtime. And you'll notice there that my favorite little icon with the little blue arrow, the blue round thing with the arrows in it, those are reconcilers. So those are kind of the eventually consistent way. This is the, okay, I'm not gonna give you all of the steps and, and assume that they were done. I'm gonna continuously check to see if there's more work that needs to be done. And Ed Lee yesterday quoted Joe Bita about Kubernetes being kind of this, I'm, you know, the words that I use is a system of infinite loops, a system of reconcilers where you can just implement reconcilers, install those reconcilers, and then Kubernetes will make sure that those reconcilers continue to operate. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to point out to you that we're going to put a stake in the ground. And our stake in the ground is that Kubernetes is the GitOps runtime. It's the GitOps runtime. It goes back to that statement that I just made where Ed quoted um, Joe Bita, which is, hey, if we're doing these reconcilers and I have a system, I have a technology that is all about reconcilers, making, having a way to register reconcilers, having a way to um, make sure that those reconcilers are running, giving them an environment to run in, all of those types of things. Why not use that system? So GitOps is to a great extent about reconcilers. So we're going to use a runtime for reconcilers and that's Kubernetes. So then going back to this picture, if I overlay Kubernetes in a couple of places there that says, ah, I'm using Kubernetes for the reconcilers and I'm using etcd as the place where my compiled declarative configurations go. Yesterday, I talked about composition and compilation of YAMLs and some of the other sources. It's now etcd where those things are landing. But hang on a second. You might be saying, Cornelia, didn't you tell me yesterday that GitOps applied to targets other than Kubernetes? And now you're saying you've put a stake in the ground that it's Kubernetes? Um, well, the answer is a little bit nuanced, and that's why I wanted to talk about it today. The GitOps runtime, absolutely, we've put the stake in the ground that's running on Kubernetes. That allows me to have reconcilers on the left-hand side, which are all about getting reconciling from some sources, Git and some of the other sources we just talked about, 
that also gives me a platform in which I can run the reconcilers that are going to deliver things to some target. Now, the interesting thing that happens is that if that target is Kubernetes, it allows us to do something really cool. It allows us to have the GitOps runtime running inside of the target. For those of you who joined us yesterday morning, you heard Alexis talking about the pull model and the value of having the GitOps process inside of the system rather than on the outside of the black box, that that gives us some advantages on a, around observability and the ability to operate things in an optimum way. So that's why GitOps, to a large extent, has got its first foothold in the Kubernetes area because it allows us to explore this pull model and really realize some value on that. But it does something else as well, is that this particular scenario presents some very interesting, um, some interesting deployment topology options. So many of you are probably starting your journey here by just thinking about the data center. You're figuring out how to stand up your Kubernetes clusters in a data center. You're figuring out how to do application delivery into those Kubernetes clusters. And so you've got your, your Git repository, you've got your Kubernetes clusters, you've got the GitOps runtime that is pulling from that, and it's deploying things into that very target runtime. But yesterday, I also started to suggest that there are other places where we might want to put Kubernetes. So for example, we're starting to see more and more uptake of Kubernetes at edge locations, things like stores, factory floors, those types of things where we might have, you know, 5,000, 10,000 stores, or maybe, maybe it's just 200 factory floors, but it, we've got some edge locations. This topology that allows us to have the GitOps runtime running within the, the runtime at the edge location allows us to do this. So not only is observability an advantage of running the GitOps runtime inside of the running system, but it also allows us to do the pull model from a remote area. Now, I'll tell you that imagine we've got 5,000 Starbucks locations. If there was some centralized controller that was responsible for going out and reaching every one of those 5,000 stores, I think most of you can pro are already cringing at the thought of that. It's the old hub and spoke model, and that means that we've got a central We've, we, we have to, we, we have a, a potentially a, a single point of failure, even if you deploy it in an HA style, you're depending on a whole lot of network connectivity to be there. If instead you pull that, you, you move that reconciliation into the target itself, into the edge, then the edge is able to pull in from the Git repository. Oh, by the way, of course, there's some security concerns as well. We don't necessarily want to open firewalls to allow somebody from the outside to poke into any particular Starbucks location and then compromise the point of sale system, for example. So there's some security implications of doing that as well. But then finally, yesterday, I also showed the notion of cell towers. Sure enough, absolutely, we can run. Kubernetes is small enough, and we heard Vuk talking about this yesterday about using Kubernetes in the telco space. And Kubernetes is efficient enough and small enough to be able to run on a cell tower. And the GitOps runtime is small enough to run within that. So you can do things like draw the configurations that you need for a set of cell towers from some centralized control plane that is controlling those policy declarations out um, to the network. So hopefully that gives you a sense of, of uh, how, um, how, that, to, how that, that particular way of running the GitOps runtime on Kubernetes, if your target is Kubernetes, it, it affords you these very interesting deployment topologies. But let's come back for a moment to talk about targeting other runtimes, because there's one element that I want to touch upon here as well. So if we go back to this picture here, you can see that I've got the GitOps runtime and it's connecting to Git and potentially other, other stores as well. And 
I want to be able to target infrastructure, physical infrastructure, boxes, or cloud infrastructure. So, you know, Amazon, a Amazon Web Services or um, Google Cloud or Azure Cloud, you know, those types of things. And I'm not targeting their Kubernetes offerings, but I'm targeting their infrastructure. And we heard Javeria yesterday talk about instrumenting and automating a whole bunch of things in their GCP environment. So being able to do that. And certainly you can, ins you can then, of course, store in your GitHub repository those declarative configurations, and you can have a reconciler running inside of GitOps runtime that's pushing those things out. And stay tuned for the session right after this one, where we're going to drill in a little bit more on um, whether it has to be a reconciler or not. So we'll, we'll come back to that, a reconciler running in Kubernetes. So we can push those things out. Now, an interesting thing is that one of the things that you might want to instrument onto that infrastructure is you may want to use a GitOps process to manage the Kubernetes on your physical infrastructure or on your cloud infrastructure. So you've got a reconciler that's running in the GitOps runtime on the left-hand side. It's you know, running on the right. And it turns out that there are reconcilers that are doing exactly this. And I'm sure many of you are already saying the word out loud or the acronym out loud. Yes, I'm talking about CAPI. I'm talking about Cluster API. So Cluster API gives you the specification that's on the left-hand side where you can now declare your cluster configurations, store them in Git. And then it also gives you, as a part of the operators, it gives you controllers that take that declared configuration and make it so. And there's providers for a number of different infrastructures. So you can install that CAPI controller into your GitOps runtime. Now, this gets even more interesting. So that's where we're deploying the Kubernetes out there. This gets even more interesting when once I've installed Kubernetes into that environment, I can do what in the CAPI community they call um, pivoting, where I now remember the GitOps runtime, the stake in the ground was we need to have Kubernetes. Well, I now have Kubernetes in that I, I used GitOps to bootstrap that Kubernetes cluster. And then I installed the GitOps runtime in that Kubernetes cluster. So now I have the picture that I had on the previous slide. So I just showed you a way that you can bootstrap those um, edge, edge locations. So that gets pretty darn cool. All right, so I keep talking about this GitOps runtime and I haven't showed you a lot of fidelity on that. I've been talking a little bit about the left edge and the right edge, the sources on the left and the, the, the targets on the right. What I wanna do is share with you some of the thinking the direction that we're going in thinking about kind of you know crafting a little bit more fidelity and a little bit formality around this GitOps runtime. I'll be frank with you in the last even though we've been talking about GitOps for a couple of years we've been talking a lot about a bunch of GitOps tools but I think we've reached a level of maturity where we can actually start talking about forming these things into an organization, organizing them in such a way that it's not perhaps just a whole bunch of tools that you have to assemble together yourself, but instead they form a runtime or perhaps even a GitOps platform. So to show you and forgive the very, very ugly coloring and the ugly diagrams, all the ugly diagrams, you know, those are mine because I'm an engineer and I draw ugly diagrams. But let me just highlight a few things in here. So I've expanded on that GitOps runtime. Again, you can see the sources on the left-hand side, and I perhaps should have shown the, the targets on the right-hand side. So you can be targeting Kubernetes, you can be targeting physical machines, cloud, et cetera, on the right-hand side. And I've already been talking about the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And you can see there that I have described a number of controllers, and I've put them in two, two different buckets. On the left-hand side, you can see what I'm calling GitOps delivery controllers. So if you remember earlier, I had that diagram where I had the three loops. We started with the two loops, CI, and then continue uh, GitOps. 
And then I expanded GitOps into separating out delivery and, and operations. GitOps is the entirety of that. It's both delivery and operations, but it does make sense for us to separate those two. So that's what I've, that's reflected in here as well. So we've got the, uh, the GitOps delivery controllers. And in there, you can see things you're familiar with, things like the Flux controller, the Helm controller. Ah, I should probably put Argo CD in here as well. We chatted about that. So please forgive the myopic, um, you know, kind of Weaveworks view on this. But then you can see here that I also talk about an image registry controller. Now, if you're wondering if that exists, well, no, not really. This is somewhat future looking here. It's, if you will, we're starting to take some of the concepts that we have embedded in Flux and start to decouple those. And in fact, Lee talked a little bit about that yesterday in the unconference at the end, at the end of the day yesterday. Maybe there's a credential store controller. Maybe there's an S3 controller. Who knows? We also heard Chris Hine talk about the uh, GitHub, GitHub controller. So obviously there's some connectivity in, in GitHub, Git, uh, Git, to GitHub there as well. The key though, is that all of these things are implemented as reconcilers because that really is what makes it cloud native and brings it into this modern distributed world that's constantly changing. And then on the right hand side, you can see here that I've sketched out a vision for a number of different controllers. We have infrastructure controllers. Again, we'll talk about that more in just a moment. Then we have Kubernetes lifecycle management controllers. Yeah, like CAPI, like CAPI that I was just talking about. Or yesterday, um, Nate from AWS was talking about EKS Cuddle. So maybe there's some controller around EKS Cuddle. That would be cool. Then there's controllers that do things like lay down some additional infrastructure in your Kubernetes environment. So my, my esteemed colleague, Stefan Prodon, has created some of those things in things like service meshes and flagger and those types of things. There might be storage controllers. Then there might be some specialization controllers where Nate talked about this yesterday, where you, you package up some things as a profile and you say, hey, now I have a number of controllers that I want to insert into my Kubernetes cluster that are going to provide some machine learning. And we saw heard David talking about machine learning from, from the Microsoft perspective as well. And then finally, you've got all of the things that Kubernetes is best known for, which is all the controllers that, that run and keep running all of the applications that you're deploying into the Kubernetes environment. So that hopefully gives you a little bit more of a viewpoint into the system itself. Now, in the last five minutes or so, I wanna talk about one last thing. And this is where we're really starting to get very future looking. And that is, I wanna highlight another term in the, the thing on the right-hand side. I've been talking an awful lot about software agents and reconcilers the whole time. And then, but I wanna emphasize this other word, which is closed loop. We talk about it's constantly diffing desired state and actual state, but what happens when those diverge? Sometimes, and I'll show you an example in just a moment, sometimes the right action on divergence is to go back and record that as a desired state in the GitHub repository. Hmm, what do I mean by that? So let's start with this example. Let's say that I am doing progressive delivery and we had James Governor yesterday talking about progressive delivery um, and there's been mention of Flagger in a number of different places and I do believe that Stefan's gonna talk about more about Flagger very shortly um, coming up this morning. So let's think about this progressive delivery case. I have my application configuration here and you can see that I'm pointing to version one. I go into my GitHub repository and I change that to version two. Because I have a delivery controller that is watching GitHub, it's going to deliver that to the Kubernetes runtime. And so I have version one running and now version two is desired. But instead of just replacing version one with version two, which is what would happen if you didn't have something like Flagger doing progressive delivery for you. Um, what we're gonna do is we're going to do this progressive delivery where Flagger says, ah, I'll take, I'll, I'll take a little control over this. So Flagger is taking control over what was baked into Kubernetes um, natively. And it says, okay, well, let me take 
5% of the traffic and deploy it to version two. Ah, things are looking good. So I'm going to up that to 10% of the traffic and then 20 and 30 and 40 and 50. And everything's looking good so far, but then things catch on fire. And Flagger says, whoa, I'm detecting some anomalies here. I'm going to keep version one running and I'm going to stop the version two rollout. You see the divergence there? The actual state is version one. And to some extent, that's really your desired state. You would rather have version one running soundly than version two burning down. But how does the GitHub repository know that the desired state actually is not version two, because version two is problematic, the desired state is version one. So if we go back then to our GitOps runtime, what I'm talking about here is augmenting it with some type of closed loop. Now, this is something that doesn't exist today, and I'm inviting you all as a part of the GitOps community to work with us on coming up with what's the right design for closing that loop. Let's start doing some experiments in this way. Is, the, is, it, is that closed loop controller a runtime controller? Or is it a delivery controller? I honestly am not sure. I think it's too early for us to be able to answer that question holistically. So that is really what I mean by closed loop. Now, I want to wrap things up here by saying, by posing the question of, I keep talking about these four principles. And incidentally, we published a blog post yesterday on the WeWorks blog on those four principles that goes into some of what I talked about yesterday and some of what I've talked about and drilled in on today. And so I'll pose the question on your behalf, do I need all four principles? And I'll tell you, yeah, you do. Just like you need reconcilers and you need that, you know, the, the replica set controller to really move into cloud native from an application perspective. If you build things as microservices, but you, you don't have a, a, a runtime in which you can schedule those microservices, then you really are not going to get all the benefits that you need. So, yeah, I think ultimately, in the same way that, um, that we have embraced some of the microservices principles that were a little bit um, tenuous five years ago, we've really come to embrace those in a big way. We will eventually embrace all four of these principles completely. But the reality is that you can get there incrementally. And we are, we've heard some of that and we'll continue to hear some of that throughout the rest of the day. So what order do you do it in? Well, that's up to you, but I'm gonna suggest an order here. For example, um, you might start with automation. Automation is a fantastic place to start. And Kyle and I talked a little bit about that. He was a, you know, an automation and release engineer when he started his GitOps journey. And I don't think that's a coincidence. So maybe that's a really good place to start. Then actually start storing more and more of your stuff in Git. There's nothing bad that comes out of that. Again, the Git semantics that we were talking about earlier. Start moving toward declarative configuration because that will set us up to be able to now leverage these software agents to realize those desired states. What we're really getting at here with all of this is that GitOps is really all about the art of modern operations. And so with that, I thank you for your attention and I'll hand it back over to our hosts.